Good morning. My name is Dominic Wing. I'm a corporate solicitor with Ashford Solicitors. And we're here to provide an overview of the legal support services we can provide to the Southwest Creative Technology Network members. Ashford's itself is a full service law firm, predominantly based in the Southwest with offices in Exeter, Plymouth, Taunton and Tiverton, and two decent sized offices in Bristol and London as well. As a full service law firm, we can deal with business and individual queries as they arise. Uh, please check our website if you need to. Uh, our team details are set out here, so please do get in touch with us at any time following this webinar or at any time at all just to discuss anything, any of the matters raised, and, uh, and we can pick up on those directly. So I will start by running through the corporate elements of the support that we can provide. As you can see from this slide, we'll touch on company structures, establishing a business, ongoing responsibilities, ownership and management, and raising finance. And my colleague Tom Phipps will deal with the commercial and IP elements that you can see listed here. These are of course not exhaustive uh, details. We can touch on any other points relating to your companies or businesses uh, and any other matters that you may, may require assistance with. But this is just to touch on a few things that we think may be relevant. So firstly, we'll start on company structures. Um, there are various business and company structures available to commercial enterprises. You'll see details of them here on the slides. They each have their own set of governance rules and obligations. Um, the most common forms, as shown here, are sole traders, private limited companies, which can be limited either by shares or by guarantee, public companies, which are where shares are held, partnership structures, uh, including general partnerships, limited partnerships, and limited liability partnerships. And then we have details of some community interest companies and charitable companies which are invariably run along private company lines. Again, I don't intend to go through each of these in detail. Uh, the details here are set out on the slides here, but we can, of course, pick up on any particular matters that may arise out of these particular structures. Uh, we are assuming that most companies within the membership are already incorporated as limited companies, but we can, of course, advise on other structures as well. So if we scroll through on to the art slide dealing with limited companies. So private limited company is the form of company that we tend to deal with mostly on a on a day to day basis. It's the most common form of business structure and one which definitely benefits most company types. Um, for a limited company, the most important documents, documents, I should say, are its constitutional documents. Articles of Association are a constitutional document which is applicable to all limited companies. Every company has a set of articles, and these can be either in a form of model articles, which are effectively off the shelf statutory led articles also bespoke provisions can also be included and they can also have a set of bespoke articles of association articles will tend to deal with matters involving shares directors shareholders dividends it might deal with things like rights attached to the shares it will deal with share transfer rights share issue rights it will deal with how me meetings can be convened between shareholders and directors it can be deal with how directors appointments appointed or removed, how shares are issued and how dividends can be declared. Shareholder agreements we've also included reference to on this slide. Now these are not typical to every single company. These are private contractual documents between shareholders, but they can be relevant and they can be very useful in many circumstances. 
and this may be something that you would like to touch upon further. So these are private documents, as I say. Articles of association are available at the company's house. Shareholder agreements are not. They will be kept by the company and by the shareholders privately. And these will define typically rights between shareholders that may arise in certain circumstances that may be more commercially led, commercially driven. And in the event of any conflict between such shareholder agreement provisions and the articles, the shareholders agreement will typically take precedence. So such a document might include director's rights, rights to seats on the board, information rights relevant to the company for the shareholders to access certain information, consent rights relevant to certain of the shareholders, so that commercial matters of the company cannot be conducted without the consent of certain shareholders. Deadlock provisions, typically useful where there are a 50-50 shareholder structure. Um, there might be restrictive covenants in the event of a shareholder leaving the company that they are then bound not to do certain things for a period of time following selling their shares. There may even be lever provisions which will determine how much consideration a departing shareholder will receive for their shares. And there will be other provisions there, commercial provisions, provisions that you wish to engage with the other shareholders, including, for example, a lock-in period whereby shares will not be able to be transferred for a certain period of time while the shareholders are in place. So again, we can touch on those elements in greater detail as required. But for all such limited companies, there are ongoing administrative responsibilities, which will mainly be the responsibility of the director and or the company secretary. So that will include ensuring that the company's statutory books and records are kept up to date, that all the company's house filings are done. There are certain filings that need to be done on an annual basis, such as filing a set of accounts and a confirmation statement, which will confirm the any changes to personnel in the company and to the changes to detail, changes to directors or shareholders. There will be other matters that will need to be filed at company's house relevant to any new director appointments, whether there is any change or any change in the share structure or issues of new shares in the company. Who actually is the what they call the people of significant control of the company, the persons of significant control, sorry, PSCs. So this is a relatively new requirement just to understand who actually controls a company and has the ownership of it. So such things are important and will need to be filed at the relevant times with Companies House. But companies also required to maintain their own statutory books and registers, which will detail the register of members, the register of directors, register of any share allotments, and register of PSCs, for example. These are important to keep up to date and to keep on top of, particularly when looking to perhaps sell a company or sell a business, in which case such things will need to be made sure they are up to date. So turning to directors themselves, um, directors are granted powers by the articles of the company and also under the Companies Act, which is applicable to all limited companies. A company must have at least one director, clearly, um, but they usually have more and they are responsible for the day to day management of the business. Um, the articles will set out certain provisions relevant to the company, to the directors and to their powers and duties, but they're also a set of general duties which have been formed over many years of court judgments and we've set those out here. Now these are very important for directors to abide by. If they do not, the company can bring a claim against the director for breaching any of these rules. So very important things to be aware of. Shareholders within a company have a slightly different role. They are the owners of the business not typically involved day to day, but they will be involved and their consent and powers will be applicable to certain things that a company will do. So the shareholders will, by resolution, pass certain matters as they're required to do so under the Companies Act. For example, changing the articles of association, issuing certain shares in most circumstances, changing a company name, if you wish to re-register a company from a private company to a public company, for example, then these will all require shareholder consent. 
As you can see, the limit, limit of liability under a limited company is applicable to shareholders and their financial liability. They will not be liable for more than the amount unpaid on their shares. Turning on with we're now looking at raising finance for the business. Now there are several avenues here, as you can see from this slide. Um, most typically, we tend to see the companies will raise finance through issuing shares or equity in itself to investors or to existing shareholders in return for cash. So typically, this would obviously involve a valuation exercise of the company, understanding how much the company is worth, coming up with a figure that the company thinks would be needed for it to either maintain what it's currently doing or to invest in any new business opportunities, and then offering a certain proportion of the company to those investors in return for the shares and in return for their cash. There are private equity investment can often be found via three particular avenues. Venture capital, which is typically involving bringing technical and managerial expertise to small startup businesses. Buyouts, which is when a company has been established for a greater longer time and the existing management may wish to invest monies in and buy a controlling stake of the business. And development growth capital, whereby investment in mature company businesses to expand or restructure their operations. We've also touched on other investment opportunities, which may just simply be friends, private investors, bank loans. But it all depends on the often on the size of the business, the opportunities it's offering under its share issue and the valuation of that business at that particular time. Crowdfunding is a certainly now a very much a viable option and a very growing avenue for certainly smaller but ever more established companies are also using crowdfunding as a another investment vehicle to run alongside perhaps more traditional forms of investment. For crowdfunding, there are generally three types of crowdfunding. as investment run by companies such as Crowdcube and Cedars, whereby cash is invested on the basis of a pitch by the, the relevant crowdfunded platform and the cash is invested for shares in the company. This is regulated by the FCA, as is lending crowdfunding, uh, operated by such companies as Funding Circle, which is a loan to the business in return for their loan amount back with interest after a certain period of time. And then the other main form is just what's called donations and rewards crowdfunding. So this is, as it says, whereby money is invested in return for, not for, for a loan rights or any shares in the company, but for a reward of some kind, a t-shirt, a, uh, a loaf of bread from a baker, for example. These are things we've seen before, and Crowdfunder is a good local uh, reward-based crowdfunding platform that's currently out there. Whenever seeking any such investment, you should certainly seek advice from a solicitor and from an accountant. The solicitor would need to advise on the existing documents relevant to the company and any restrictions or rights that would need to be adhered to before seeking such investments. They would also be involved in documenting the investments, setting up the next steps, completing filings at company's house as required. Accountants should also be, their advice should also be sought because you'll need to value the business typically to, to advise investors of their stake in that company. And they'll also be able to deal with tax advice and any other accounting matters. So do take that into account before considering any finance opportunities. Finally, we're just on this particular section of the presentation. We're just looking at any key considerations around selling your company or your business. Now, this may be early days. It may not be something you're thinking of right now, but it's certainly something to be aware of and something that can be considered at, the, at an early stage, just so that the company is in a good place when it decides it does want to consider this further. 
So there are two main types of company sale or business sale. Sale of the shares in the company to a third party would effectively sell everything to that third party. So this is a all encompassing transaction involving sale of the full ownership and all obligations, liabilities, duties, everything that it has, all its assets uh, to the buyer. So this is a fairly involved transaction. There will be considerable due diligence undertaken by the buyer so they understand exactly what it is they will be buying. On the other side, there is what's called an asset sale or a business sale, whereby the buyer will acquire certain assets which it wishes to take forward and perhaps consume within its own business, but will leave other elements behind to the existing shareholders to, to do with as they wish. So again, there will be considerable due diligence undertaken by the buyer in this to ascertain exactly what it is they wish to purchase and just as importantly, what it is they wish to leave behind. And that can mean leaving behind certain liabilities and obligations that they don't want to take on. So vitally important that the, if considering such matters that do seek legal advice in relation to this, um, the documents involved are often quite lengthy and quite involved. Your due diligence can be lengthy. And there will be certain things as a seller of a business that you'll be required to give to a buyer. Now, this will be in the form of either warranties and or indemnities, and we can advise further on those. Um, time scale for such matters, it can take a while for these things to complete, but we certainly work hard to make sure that these are done and matters are exchanged and completed as timely as possible.